Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCready. It's been a long season, Bruce. It's been a, a long, long season. season. Long season. And the orders <laughs> end the regular season, regular season, with a what was it five to one in the end, five to one loss mm-hmm. to the Avalanche of Colorado. Bruce, by the end of this podcast, we will know who the order is going to play in the first round. Vegas tanked its game and lost, not wanting to face the orders at home and, to the Ducks. And That's it looks like uh, LA is in the process of tanking its game. Not wanting to play the orders, they're now t- they've just given up two quick goals, highly suspect goals in the third period <laughs> to the Chicago Blackhawks. Both teams now are officially doomed, as far as I'm concerned. Both, you know, with their tanking here, there's no way they're going to beat the Oilers. That's my position. Anyway, we'll talk about that in the conundrum. I'm going to keep glancing over here. I'll warn people, but uh, it's three three with fourteen. All right, focus, to go. Bruce, focus, focus, podcast. And L.A. needs one point to clinch third place. So. We'll know soon enough who wins. Yep, we will. All right. We shall know. And, yeah, they should, focus, L.A. David Chicago has what? to lose. L.A. Has to, <laughs> L.A. has to lose in regular time, I guess, for um, yes. uh, for Vegas to advance against the Twitters. I'm hoping Vegas goes to the other side. I just think it would be poetic justice. For them to, to to face a couple big tough physical teams in the first round in Dallas, and uh, and uh, Winnipeg or whoever it is they're going to have to play. All right, there ain't no easy teams in any in any side of it, but um, that's really tough, I think over there. All right, Bruce. Um, two good things, two bad things, two numbers, one conundrum. What is your good thing, Amundo? Yeah, I'm going to have to go with the play of Warren Fogle in this game. Wow. Who, he was just all over it, David. And no points to show for it in 18 minutes and 24 seconds. All he had was seven shots on net, 14 shot attempts. This after, I think he had 17 against San Jose on Monday. 14 shot attempts. And he was just a buzzsaw out there for basically the whole mm. game, just stealing pucks. He had two official takeaways and just taking it hard to the net time and again. You'd think he was still going for a milestone goal, even as he got got it in the last game. But I thought his effort and performance was little short of tremendous in this game. Really stood out in a, in a game that uh, didn't have a whole lot going for it. 14 shot attempts. It's like, yay, I don't have to pass it to Leon every time I get the fuck I can shoot myself. He was amazing, Bruce. He was yeah. amazing. And he showed what he can do, I think, on a certain level here. I mean, he, I mean, he's been playing so well uh, as we've, we on this podcast have recognized for the last year, um, cal- calendar year. He started playing this way in January 2023. 4-3 for Chicago. Seriously. 12 minutes left. 13 minutes left. Like LA just completely cropped the bed to start they, the third period. They're, they're they were leading. Them. They were leading 3 1. They were out shooting Chicago something like 24 6 after the second period. And bang, bang, bang. Wow. No one wants to play the Oilers, Bruce. Well, that may be the takeaway here. This kind of blows me away. I thought when the Vegas lost, it was a done deal. But, I mean, how do you blow it? Anyway, we'll we'll continue to keep an eye on it. Anyway, uh, 17 shot attempts for Fogel against San Jose. Eight last night and uh, 14 tonight. And I think tops on the team in all three games for whatever that's worth. What it, what it says is that after, I would say, a couple of weeks of not doing a whole hell of a lot, he really came alive and and was feeling it. And uh, good on him for uh, carrying the colors. Nine major contributions to grade A shots. That's like a McDavid-like total. Um and he had five grade A shots himself out of his whatever 14. 
shot attempts. So that's a um, heck of a game for Warren Fogle. Too bad he, he deserved a point or two. Yeah. Yeah, so my good thing mm-hmm. is is uh, the three young speedsters, McLeod, Holloway, and uh, Philip Broberg. McLeod was all over this game. He was making plays. All, he and Fogel were really playing well together. And it's to the point where, you know, if you're looking for a, uh, if you're looking who should play on a third line, like, because they have kind of seven players right now vying for the top six, Fogel sure combines well with uh, Ryan McLeod. And I wish we'd seen, did they have Holloway on their line? No, I don't, no, they didn't, did they? Or did they mix up their lines tonight? They kind of mix, they they mixed, mixed them up. Because they had 11 forwards only. They actually mm-hmm. played a man short despite having six extra players available. <laughs> they sought out seven. Brilliant. I, I love yeah. it. I love that they, they were resting up their players, giving Nuge the night off as well. Anyway, so they were mixing and matching. But if a line of Ho- Holloway, Fogel, and McLeod, I wish we'd seen that a little bit more um, in the regular season because the, uh, that line would be so blindingly fast. And uh, McLeod and Fogel are very responsible defensive players, so it might also work on the in the defensive end. But uh, anyway, Holloway uh, did score a goal, power play goal. Um, very nice play where uh, Philip Broberg drove the puck on net, quickly drove it on net, and Holloway tipped it in as Connor Brown uh, screened the goalie. Um, Philip Broberg... Um, he did. He didn't have a perfect game, but um, I think He's he was the only defenseman. Was he the only one not my who wasn't on for a goal against. He was. He was he, on for a goal against, but he was also on for the goal four. So he was even. No, that was a power play goal, Bruce. Tonight, that was the first. He was on for a power play goal. I don't think he was on for a goal against the first goal. Oh, wrong, wrong. I'm looking oh, at. He'd be minus one. I'm looking at the wrong sheet. You're looking uh, at the wrong sheet. I'm He's, looking at he last was, night's he, game. Edmonton's goal was a power play goal, Stetcher, meaning he was not on the ice for any goals against. Correct. St- neither was Stetcher. So there, so um, both those guys weren't. Philip Broberg is, man, that guy. Once he gets his full confidence going, Bruce, I just think they're going to be glad they drafted Philip Broberg. I hope he's in Edmonton when that happens because he is big and fast. And he made a couple of nice moves in the offensive end where he's slinking around down low, uh, twisting that way and turning the other with the puck. He's very close. And um, his skating is... Well, Darnell Nurse is a really good skater. Philip Broberg's a superior skater to Nurse. And... Um, there's not a defenseman on the team. Kulak is a really good skater, but he doesn't have the edges as, as uh, Broberg does. Combined with his size, Bruce, I'm just I just can't wait for Paul Coffey to have a full year of Philip Broberg because uh, I think that's going to be outstanding if that happens. And um, I think that he made enough of an impression in, in uh, these games that if he's with the goal stature ahead of him, they might. I don't think they should. I don't think Stetcher's a better player than than Broberg right now, but they like their veterans. But if they have to call on him in the playoffs, I think they'll they're not going to hesitate to do it. I think Knobloch got a good look at him. He saw that this is a player um, who's got uh, his defensive fundamentals down, and if he just keeps it simple, can get through a playoff game. So we might see him. We might see him yet this year in the Oilers uniform. Holloway, yeah. another another solid game. So, go ahead. Robert coughed up the puck. Got a very first shift, I think, or maybe second shift, where he came out behind his own net and he just dribbled off his stick right in front. That did happen. And I'm going, you know, it's time to lose the deer in the headlights look when you're out there. And to his credit, that went away. And he made some pretty sweet plays there. Like, he's got some, some uh, real capacity to to win battles and just skate away from them because he can just do these quick reverses where he just takes the puck in a different direction and, and not walks away because the other guy has gone flying off in the other direction. Right. Yeah. He showed a couple of those in, in this game. And, and as you say, a really nice uh, point shot that was tipped in. So the guys, they call the kids, they called up from, uh, 
uh, from the miners were the ones key players on on tonight's lone happy moment where they actually got one not only past the goalie but past the goalposts as well all right your bad thing yeah i'm going to go with the national hockey league schedule maker or makers I, I, i'm envisioning uh, uh, an endless scene of monkeys with typewriters that come up with the NHL schedule this year uh, that had 10 games in the last two days of the season. For whatever reason, they stretched it out to a Thursday. 10 games in a 32-team league where one team, Edmonton Oilers, played two of those games and uh, uh, in two kind of far-flung places, very far-flung from home, a little 5,000-kilometer uh, air miles in the last two days of the season. And they got what they deserved because this game was crap, David. It was 4 nothing at the 10-minute mark of the first period, and it wound up 5-1, and it was barely fit to watch. I mean, Oilers, you know, once they were down and out because they were completely overwhelmed early, and you could sort of see Colorado going, well... We can either beat them 25 nothing, or maybe we don't have to sweat so much because they were stinging from a couple of real bad losses, the, uh, the Avalanche, and they iced their A team against an Edmonton team that was home and cooled out. And in part because of the schedule and in part because it's probably a good strategy anyway, the Oilers benched their entire power play. And they benched, uh, you know, I think their top six point scorers and their top six goal scorers with uh, uh, Ekholm and Kane added to the list. And it was, the resistance was kind of wet paper bag material in the first 10 minutes. And then the whole rest of the game, like 50 minutes of this game, was garbage time. And... I mean, you could argue even earlier than that, but certainly once it was four nothing, <clears throat> and just and the schedule was just so poorly drawn up, with no semblance of fairness or, or balance, and uh, it's just not good enough for you know professional league. Like, why wouldn't they have it set up where all the teams were playing on the last day of the season? Instead, they had some done on Monday or Tuesday and. Other teams still playing hard. In Colorado, they had three days off before this game. And, and Edmonton it's... played two of the three days, yeah. and now third and four. Well, that's a mismatch any time. But if this game had meant something, that really would not have been a fair fight even then. And keep it simple. Just in the last two games, play your closest geographic teams. And every team yeah. play their closest geographic teams. How hard is that? I mean, you could just you just write that in first. Those are the first two yeah. games you mark in mm-hmm. um, on your schedule is the last yeah. two games, and then you, then you know that you're, you're getting it right. Yeah, yeah I agree. The, Although the for, east, did, the east yeah. where they do have these short road trips, no matter what, played zero games in the last two days. So anyway, and at least they've kind of figured some of it out in that in the playoffs they're starting in the east on Saturday, and. Uh, and the West starts to get involved on Sunday, and it looks like the Oilers will play on Monday. So at least they have a couple of days to get their win back and prepare for uh, whoever's leading still 4-3 with five minutes left, David. Indeed. So uh, anyway, they got at least got a couple of days back. So at least they quasi-fixed it, but the, just the way the schedule was backloaded was insane. So that's my bad thing. Uh with a with a special shout out bad thing for whoever on the orders approved this mess. Bruce, I can't my the uh, team doesn't have any input in in something that egregious. Not it wasn't good. My uh, bad thing was the play of Darnell Nurse and Cody Cece this game, even though it's a nothing game. Darnell Nurse was on, made five major mistakes on grade A shots against, and Cody Cece made six major mistakes on grade A shots against, all told, both at even strength and shorthanded. They were out for a number of goals against. Um, and it's. I'm just going to focus on one play. It's actually garbage time. It's early in the third period. It's already five to one. And But Cece decides he's, the Oilers are playing a, a zone defense this year. But all of a sudden, Cece's, 
chasing his player like it was last year against Vegas in the playoffs. He's chasing his player out towards, you know, the ringette line above the circles. Um, and down low now is Darnell Nurse covering two players. One of them is Miko Rantanen. Anyway, there's a the puck gets worked back from the, the to the point, and there's a shot on net, and Rantanen is there to tip him because CeCe's way out of the picture, and, and they play a zone, and it's no one's, like, they're just, no one's covering for him because they're not thinking that way. CeCe's got to be in his position. He's supposed to hold, and instead he's charging around like he was, like he doesn't know, that, like he hasn't had 82 games to figure it out. So then um, the puck goes into the corner, and CC charge. He's now back. He's gotten back into the position, but he's on the wrong side. And Nurse is kind of standing there, covering no one. Meanwhile, Miko Rantanen, who's just Who? tipped the first shot on net, <laughs> exactly. Miko Rantanen, and Darnell Nurse doesn't make the read. He just kind of watches, stands there. He's not. I don't know. <laughs> and the puck goes out to Rantanen, who gets a great shot on net, like a five alarm shot. Bruce, to me, the biggest question mark on the owners hitting in, heading into the playoffs is this partnership of Nurse and CeCe. They've got to get their shit together. They've got to play better. They've got to play sound, fundamental defensive hockey. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. And it's getting frustrating watching that not happening. And it was frustrating in this, this, this game, um, nothing game. Would have been nice to see them just keep it simple, keep it safe. But there's, they seem at this point like, anyway, <laughs> they've done it in the past. They have played stretches of solid defensive hockey. This is my biggest worry, though, heading into the playoffs, whether they can do it right now, whether they can get it together. Yeah, there was a couple of nice defensive plays early in the game from uh... – uh, well, CC made one, Nurse made one, I think um, Kulak made one, where, you know, they had a good stick around the net to save a tap in. And he, that was just under the, you know, the sweltering pressure that started the game. But those few defensive plays got lost in the swarm of shots and goals, you know, in that opening 10 minutes. And after that, the damage was done. And, you know, Orders actually played all right. The rest they did. Of the way. I liked and, the game actually. And they, you know, from four nothing to five one. If anything, they were maybe slightly the, well, at least the even team. And uh, they, um, but they never had a chance. There was no way they were going to ever get back in that game, and and they didn't. But it doesn't yeah. much matter. It doesn't. After the second period, it was nine to three for grade A shots for the Oilers. So. Um, don't worry, Bruce. LA's not coming back. They're tank. They've don't tanked. Think so. They're they've they're tanking. Both these teams do not want to play the Oilers, and it's coming out in their play tonight. And I think it's a. They found out Vegas lost, and they're like, "Oh well, we better lose too." The then. very telling <laughs> thing that we're witnessing here. Well, I'm not listening, witnessing. I'm just talking about something I'm not even watching, so I have no idea. Vegas didn't that's look how, good. They showed the end of that game too. That's how I take it, Bruce. This is a very good sign for the Oilers, whoever they play in the next round. Um. We are at our numbers. What's your number? Yeah, I'm going to go with 49, which is the number of wins that Edmonton ends the season with. So 60% of their 82 games. In other words, a little frustrating. They did, you know, they had 48 with five games to go, and of course those games were all packed into a week, and they wound up going one, three, and one. Sort of a bookend to the two, nine, and two that they started the season with. And almost all, you know, 46 of the wins packed into the, uh, uh, what is it? No, two nine and one they started the season with. So into the sort of 65 games in between, they, they got almost all of their wins. And, you know, pretty impressive number. But after last year's 50, you know, you want to, it's kind of nice to sort of become a regular 50, 50 t- uh, win team. And so... Uh, uh, in the end, it's a little bit of a a bitter taste to, you know, just just um, get so close to it and then just not almost have reason to win games at the at the very end. So, but that's uh, as good a number as I got on this night. I've already given you Fogel's 14 shot attempts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Here's the number. The Kings have outshot, outshot shot Chicago 13 to 3. So it's maybe I'm being a little hard on the Kings. <laughs> That's a pretty solid out shooting. 3 13 on the night. Yeah, exactly. And Talbot has let four in on 13 shots, and he looked pretty dreadful on the two that I saw. It is Cam Talbot. I can see the 4 3. Yeah, well. So maybe that's the team we wanted to be playing, but it's the team I was hoping they'd play, but not to be. It looks like a eh? there is now two a uh, minute forty nine. Yeah. Anyway, all right, Bruce. My number is five for five, and um, that's five playoff seasons in Ken Holland's five years as GM of the Orders. When he took over the team, there was. Credible rumors that Connor McDavid was very unhappy with the situation in Edmonton. The Oilers had lost, you know, Elliot Friedman reported that, as I recall, um, at the time. And um, I don't take a lot of the rumors out of Toronto seriously, but I do take it when Elliot says it very seriously. And um, they just missed the playoffs two years in a row under Peter Shirelli. In retrospect, Shirelli made some terrible trades. But it's also fair to say that um, under Shirelli, the Oilers were significantly sidelined because their their best left shot defenseman, Andre Sekera, got badly injured and was never the same player in 2017. What happened? Power play. Goal. Power Ooh. play for LA. Puck over glass. Power One, play for LA. 142 left, so they're going to get a six on four. Now we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> so... Uh, they lost Sakaretti injury. They lost Clefbaum. Clefbaum was never the same after the 2017 playoffs, in my opinion. He got injured and was never the same player. So they were significantly yeah. down um, uh, under Shirelli. Anyway, Ken Holland's come in, and he has he's made a number of good deals. Bruce um, brought in Matthias Ekholm, brought in uh, Zach Hyman, um, brought in traded for Warren Fogle. Um, not that you know. That was not a popular score. move. Did they? Did LA they score? They scored. Yes. Four four. One twenty one left. <laughs> can they do it? Well, can they hold on against mighty Chicago for one twenty one to get it to overtime? Seeing the shots on goal in that game, Victor Arvidsson. We're going to hate him in about two. Oh, we ten are. minutes. <laughs> we are going to hate him. Yeah, one thing I can tell you this, David, I'm going to have zero problem hating whichever team Edmonton plays in the first round. Zero problems. Yeah. <laughs> I would much rather play L.A., see the Oilers play L.A., just because I want to, I just think it's a fitting punishment for Vegas to go over that other side. I think the other side is a little harder. Because we'll in my opinion, the Oilers are the, Oilers are the hardest team, but... Dallas is just a tick below the Oilers. And I don't think Vancouver is um, as hard as some of the other top teams, which I may regret saying shortly <laughs> in a few weeks. But anyway, Ken Holland, um, he got it done, Bruce. Here's here's what Ken Holland has done, just looking up and down the roster. He traded Tyson Berry for Ekholm, gave, giving Evan Bouchard a good shot. He signed Hyman as a free agent. He, he locked in Nugent Hopkins on a reasonable contract. <laughs> What? Did they score? No. Drought Doughty coughed it up in the corner and then it dribbled into Talbot and he belched out this big rebound into the slot. Just like, geez, I hope Talbot starts in the series. That's all I can say <laughs> based on what I'm seeing here. All right. Um, what else did he do? He signed Darnell Nurse to a big contract, which may or may not work out. He signed Cody Cece, who, who's turned out to be a good player. He traded for Brett Kulak, who's turned out to be a, a, a super solid player. He brought in Corey Perry for nothing. He brought in Connor Brown, which may or may not turn out when they in these playoffs. He brought in Matias Yanmark, who I think is a really good player. He brought in Vincent DeHarnay. Um, or it's the Kings. Good. Okay. And uh, he brought in Calvin Pickard, and he promoted Stuart Skinner. All in all, he's gotten it... Ken Holland has gotten it right way more than he's gotten it wrong. Now, I'm not going to say that about the draft because I can't speak to that uh, without having without studying it. But my gut instinct is that maybe they didn't do so well in the draft. Although Broberg and Holloway are starting to look pretty damn good, and the yeah, LA Kings Holloway's it is going good, eh? and and Broberg, man, that was as good as he's looked to me since he's gotten in Edmonton. He looked like 
he looked like an like he could become a really good NHL player. Um, and I just want to see again see him work with Coffee. I hope Coffee comes back next year because I'm not certain that he will. You know, he seemed reluctant to coach, so mm-hmm. maybe maybe Might he won't. Be a one off. It's certainly it's certainly possible. Like, he's an interim. Yeah, I just think he would be great for Philip Broberg. Okay, yes. let's move on to our conundrum, Bruce. It's the LA Kings. How do you crack that nut? Sounds like you put shots on that. <laughs> I don't like anything. One, three, one. Oh, here we go. Schedule Monday, Wednesday, uh, game three. It says April 26th, whatever day that is, which is next. Monday, what Friday. time? Does it, does it say what time? Uh, it might have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. It looks like they're just going to cool. start. Cool. It's like they're just going to. Three start. years in a row that we've had the Kings, eh? This is the third yep. year in a row. Yep, shades of 1989 to 92. Oilers played the Kings four years in a row, the first four years after the Gretzky um, transaction to L.A. And the Kings won the first series in the 89, and then the Oilers took them out in 90, 91, and 92 to uh, level that playing field. And then it was like 30 years of fallow, and then they played them again in 22 and 23 with the Oilers winning those two series as well. So the Kings must think of the Oilers as the, the way we think of Dallas Stars at this point. <laughs> when they run into Edmonton in the playoffs, they uh, their playoffs come to an end. So let's hope that tradition continues. You know, they've got a good top nine forwards. Um, I'll give them that. Kempe, Fiala, Kopitar, Trevor Moore, Quinton Byfield, Philip Deneau, Pierre-Luc Dubois. That's eight. Victor and, Arvidsson. Uh, and Arvidsson nine. Yeah, they've got a good top nine. They've got um, Drew Doughty, who's a fantastic hockey player. Kings win in overtime, but that goal doesn't really change anything, but it just puts them one point ahead of Vegas. They already have the tiebreaker. So uh, Cam Talbot has a 9.15 save percentage this year, Bruce. Uh, not anymore. His backup, <laughs> not anymore. His backup, David Riddich. <laughs> Has a uh-huh. 921 save percentage, so they've wow. had a good save percentage. This, this team, uh-huh. you know, sometimes I yeah. can come down to the hometown shot clock guy, too. <laughs> I'm gonna suggest, but um, they're Kempe. a good team. Kempe scored. That's right. a guy that that's He's the guy the, that scares that's me. the guy that scares me as well. Kempe scares me, Arvidsson scares me. Big, fast, um, talented, byfield too. Big, fast, skilled. And they've, of course, they've got the hated Mikey Anderson, dirty player, um, who tries to injure other players. Hmm. So um, that's something to think about. But and they've got Carl Gr- Grundstrom, who charges the net hard, as I recall, and puts pucks pucks in after he bashes the goalie right through. They've got Gavrikov, uh, who's a fantastic defensive defenseman. And one of the few defensive defensemen that they can can defend McDavid okay, mm-hmm. like he's it's not like uh, Morrissey or McCarr, like defensemen who really or um, what's the guy in um, Carolina um, that can Slavin. really, yeah, who can really skate with McDavid, but he's he's really good. So this is going to be a very tough series, but I'm glad it's L.A. still. I just think the Oilers match up well against the LA Kings. The Oilers' speed um, is superior to the Kings, and the Oilers' aggression. Um, uh, the Oilers are aggressive enough and fast enough to break through the, the, that wall of the Kings' defense, that very conservative style they play. And um, I think and hope they're patient enough, too. They that, have was a, been. that was the form format they used in uh, in beating the Kings uh, uh, in the last uh, last couple of games uh, that were here four two and four one, and there was a lot of one three one going on. And what you don't want to do is see the one three one setting up when when you're behind on the scoreboard. And that last game in particular, that never happened. And Edmonton forged the lead and said, you know, come at me, bro, because, you know, at a certain point, L.A. had to break out of that deadly, boring style. And and, uh, 
uh, start to bring it. So I'm not looking forward to the series stylistically. I'm not sure it'll be uh, real exciting hockey, but you never know. Like you just list them. I mean, the top nine of the Kings, there's a lot of talented players in there. So we'll, uh, it'll be a test for 100% sure. So Vegas plays Dallas and Winnipeg plays Colorado. And Nashville is, plays Vancouver. I just love this. So to, so to get to the conference final, they've got to be Vancouver, be the best team of Vancouver, Nashville, and Los Angeles. And you've got four heavyweight sluggers, Winnipeg, Colorado, Dallas, and Las Vegas, just absolutely bashing away at each other on the other side. I like it, Bruce. I like it a lot. What do you think? I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Bruce. Yeah, saw a Vancouver fan on Twitter saying they were real real happy that uh, uh, the way one of the games wound up that it wound up that Vegas or Vancouver clinched a spot against Nashville as po- and saying that the Vancouver just basically gotten a bye to the second round. And I'm thinking, boy. Never say that. <laughs> Never say that. But it's a Vancouver That's would have going a in a few I saved think. folders, I can tell you. Yeah, Vancouver would have, <laughs> well, that's just a fan. Vancouver would have a much tougher time against um, LA or Vegas, bigger, tougher defensive teams than Nashville, I think. I think that's fair to say. But these are all really good teams in the playoffs. The Oilers could get upset. Like they could be, they, they only finished. What did they finish? Five points ahead of the Kings. Um, this this could be a this is going to be a tough. The the Kings were plus forty one on the year. The Oilers were plus fifty seven. There's not a lot separating the teams over the full year. And um, well, like last year against Vegas, it just came down to a couple of plays and you know a couple of calls and a couple of moments of execution or lack thereof. And games five and six. And even if you're, you know, you're going to the series as a clear favorite, what's that mean? 60-40 that you're going to win it? Well, 40 is a lot. Yeah, 40 is a lot. So there's no, nothing guaranteed. And, there, you know, there's, uh, unlike I think maybe the East, uh, there are, I don't think, any weak teams that made the playoffs in the West. And in the East? Washington minus 37. Going up against Rangers, you'd like the to Islanders think. minus seventeen. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple teams that, that are pretty uh, marginal. Yeah, Tampa's you know, a good. They had a turtle race for the wild card spots, eh? Who plays Washington? Plays uh, no, excuse me. Tampa plays Toronto or Boston. Uh, Boston plays Toronto, and Tampa plays Florida. Battle of Florida. Oh, that's tough for Florida. <laughs> That's tough for Florida, yeah. Yeah, they can put up with Kucherov diving all over the place. Um, <laughs> I'm part, it's part of my campaign to deny Kucherov the MVP award versus to badmouth him at every opportunity. Did you know that he was the king of overtime points? I think you've pointed that. Uh, or of, empty uh, net empty points. Net points yeah, excuse absolutely. Me. Not overtime, empty net points. Yeah, I think you've pointed that out. Yeah. That's seven in the last month. Was it 14 or was it more than, I thought it was more it was, than 14. I think it was 14 and maybe snuck in another one while I was paying attention, but he had uh, seven in the last month. And, yeah. And he got one assist in, in Toronto. That was his phantom and assist as I can remember since Marcel Dion played in the fabulous forum. Oh, really? Was it? Oh, didn't even touch him and it was and the goal was scored like it was in the defensive zone and and puck went down two other guys took it down scored and they retroactively awarded him an assist and he wound up with 100 right on the nose seriously seriously it was like a hometown decision except for it was a road game i, I just don't get it anyway uh, whatever uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's under miscellaneous at NHL.com. You can find things like posts and empty net goals in there. 
And uh, Kucherov, seven goals, seven assists, 14 points, empty net points, all-time record for empty net points in the season. Because, of course, there's so many goalie pulls so early that there's a ton of points being scored. And, yeah. And it's I, I've become quite sour towards empty net goals in general because they they uh, they they corrupt the outcomes of games. Like you know, you can say, well, this game wasn't close; it was four one, and then you find it was two one with thirty seconds left, and team gave in two empty netters because they gave one and then they pulled the guy again, <laughs> another one right away, and uh, but. Most corruptive of all was the uh, empty netter that eliminated teams from the playoffs. That was a game winner and scored in a tie game. I mean, it's got so that was control. a nothing game for the Flyers, eh? And what's his noodle? Well, Carter it was. Off? It was. It was a very much a something game. They had to win it in regulation, but by the time they got around to pulling the goalie, they had been eliminated by what had happened in another game. He had and to they pulled him that, anyway with three minutes left. He knew that, didn't he? Tortorella well, the guy, the, 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 guy uh, the um, color commentator between the benches knew it before the goalie pull and told us. Oh, so it. we don't know what Tortorella knew. Maybe he didn't even but know. It was, uh, might... it was only like one or two minutes, but it was like Detroit tied it up with three seconds left. And when they did, they Philly couldn't touch Detroit anymore. And yet, so I went, well, we know what to do about Detroit. We'll just, we'll just sink them. <laughs> ah, such is life. That's, yeah, if that's I was hockey. a Detroit fan, I yeah. would be so friggin' sour about that. Oh, man. Or a Pittsburgh fan. Yeah, I would have liked to see Sidney Crosby Imagine in the playoffs. losing on it. Yeah. And I would have liked to see Detroit in the playoffs, too. They were winning some close games at the end. Well, Bruce, you got to write the... Um, game grades tonight so I'll, yeah uh, i think uh, they'll be a little bit abrupt all right well, this game uh, isn't worthy of a whole lot of commentary and nor do i think the readers will be particularly interested in reading a, a, a loquacious report all right <laughs> well bruce thanks for talking tonight thanks for listening everyone and in the meantime and in between times this has been another edition of the cult of hockey podcast